125 million people continue to be exposed to asbestos in the workplace. So there's a big cost to you in using asbestos in dollars and lives. Research that goes into these decisions has to be directed by independent, unconflicted scientists. It's not something that just affects workers, it affects everyone. Saving one life is great, but saving many more is what I hope to accomplish. Making a profit off of people's pain and lives is wrong. We can't quit, not as long as there are hundreds of thousands of people still to be diagnosed. Ban the asbestos once and for all. I think now uh, we can entertain some questions. I'm not quite sure how long we have. Uh, are there questions? Um, I think my question is for Jacqueline. Um, have you found any cases of meso and cervical cancer? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't quite understand what you mean. Well, you were talking about ovarian cancer, that okay. mesothelioma was you know, found at, in ovarian cancer. Has there been any cases um, related to the cervix? You know, there's, there's very little in the literature related to occupational causes of cervical cancer. It hasn't been something that's been well studied. Um, uh, there's been far more interest in looking at ovarian tissue and looking at the ovarian cancers rather than cervical cancer. So to date, there's been no connection that's been made. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Barry. I just wanted to comment on the situation in Italy. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, first trial resulted in the acquittal of Stefan Schmidt-Heine on the final appeal after the conviction in the trial court and the appeal court. Uh, Mr. Schmidt-Heine was charged with manslaughter and the trial began last April 2018. The verdict is expected to be announced this Monday. So we are looking forward to seeing what the court has to say. And this time, uh, the statute of limitations will not be a defense uh, for the multi-billionaire asbestos magnate. Good. I any other questions? I have a question of Dr. Algrante. Uh, was pa part of the difficulty that you encountered in the uh, misdiagnosis of malignant mesothelioma or miscoding? Uh, well, um, from these results, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, not miscoding, it's misdiagnosis. Misdiagnosis. Okay. I think uh, um, I, we're not used to see meso cases. It's a rare cancer, and uh, in Brazil, it's, no, it's nothing that. Uh, it's in the general thought of the physician. So I think it's, uh, uh, they, they are missing cases of mesothelioma. Do, do you think it was a matter of not thinking of the diagnosis or the pathologist didn't know what they were looking for or can, can you? I think it's both. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I think both the, uh, experience of Dr. Algrate and also Dr. Moline again illustrates that if you don't think about it and you don't ask about it, then you're not going to find it. And with regard certainly to lung cancer, which I have a bit more knowledge of and experience with, a it's, it's not recent, but it seems to be increasing in aggressiveness and intensity is action on the part of defendants in asbestos litigation with regard to lung cancer to judge exposure to asbestos on the basis of how many asbestos fibers they find in the lungs rather than on the tried and true taking a detailed occupational history. And Dr. Giovanni's work has illustrated how important it is, and Dr. Moline's work, to consider not only 
uh, occupational exposures, but also environmental exposures. So I, I think the importance of taking a good history to prompt people to, doctors and others, to, to think about the disease will enhance the diagnosis of, of that disease. It will state they have lung cancer. And it will be stated in the medical records of someone with diagnosed mesothelioma whether a nurse says they have lung cancer and then that gets perpetuated through the medical records and it could be miscoded in that way. Um, I, I think um, there is, and, and the histories that one might find in a medical record are um, being used often as proof that someone, it, it's almost like a stream of consciousness. When someone gets a diagnosis, they're trying to think, where could I possibly have had this exposure? And they may throw out things that actually turn out to be not where they had the exposure, yet then they go through having to show that where their true exposure was, and no one ever asked them where they had these exposures. Um, <clears throat> and many people don't know they were exposed to asbestos whether it's from contaminated talcum powder, whether it's from someone growing up in a, in a house where there was asbestos that was used, they wouldn't have no recollection of that. And they'll say they had no exposure to asbestos and that gets perpetuated in the medical records where in fact, when one delves further, they find it. So it's really a matter of going back and, and looking holistically at both occupational, household, environmental, personal habits to really get a comprehensive history. I mean, I now ask all my, can, my folks coming to me with a history of occupational exposure to asbestos. So somebody who worked as a plumber or pipe fitter for 40 years, I ask them if they use talcum powder. And they look at me a little crazily, but you know, if I'm gonna do a comprehensive history for everybody, I'm gonna do it the same way. They came in because they had a self-defined exposure and they want to have medical surveillance, yet we need to know, did they have other exposure? And it might be that their family members used it and they're at risk. And it, maybe it'll prompt them to get the surveillance and the care they need. Uh, Linda. One quick um, point, and we haven't had a chance to really explain it to everyone, is in the next six, uh, two months, 60 days, ADO is going to produce a document with the help of our science advisory board to better help those who have been exposed, whether at the workplace or through environmental disasters, that they can have that first conversation with their physician. Because what we get now from ADO is people are terrified when they are exposed, they cannot seek a legal action because they aren't diagnosed with a disease. So we feel it's our moral responsibility to put the links together scientifically so that people who are exposed can have that conversation with your help. We'll get that done in the next 60 days. I, I think there's one other issue here that's worth mentioning with regard to lung cancer, not so much ovarian cancer, and that is when doctors are taking a history in a smoker, they hit smoking, and that's it, game over. They attribute it to smoking and don't ask any further questions. And in fact, as uh, probably everybody in this room knows, cigarette smoke and asbestos act in a synergistic manner in increasing the risk for lung cancer. That is, the risk for lung cancer, depending on how much you smoked, uh, can be increased tenfold uh, for the development of lung cancer if you're exposed to alone. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Giovanni. Eh, penso che sia un fenomeno molto diffuso quello della sottostima diagnostica del mesotelioma. She believes that the underdiagnosis of mesothelioma is very common, I think, around the world. Perché il, il mesotelioma è ancora un tumore raro. Is it still a rare tumor? In Casale Monferrato, dove il mesotelioma non è più un tumore raro. In Casale Monferrato, where mesotelioma is no longer a rare tumor. La diagnosi viene effettuata senza difficoltà in pochi giorni. The diagnosis is usually made without difficulty in a few days. Really? Purtroppo. Uh, unfortunately. 
and uh, um, gli stessi cittadini si fanno diagnosi da soli. People in Casale, they diagnose themselves. I, I can testify, anybody in a bar can tell you how to diagnose mesothelioma mm -hmm. in yourself. Quando, noi, ca, quando un cittadino casalese ha un, un po' di tosse o un dolore al torace, pensa di avere il mesotelioma. So when someone has a persistent cough or thoracic pain, they start assuming that there's a good chance they have mesothelioma. E la sensibilizzazione al problema viene ormai da 40 anni. So it's been a 40 year experience to reach the stage of awareness of mesothelioma. La diagnosi viene fatta in soli 10-15 giorni. Diagnosis is made in just 10 or 15 days. E ogni diagnosi viene riferita al registro mesoteliomi della nostra regione. And then they're all registered in their, the regional uh, mesothelioma registry for their part of Italy. E io penso che nessun mesotelioma sfugga in, nella nostra, nel nostro centro, purtroppo. So she's very confident that there are no undetected mesotheliomas in her center. A tragedy that it takes an epidemic of a very rare and highly fatal disease to be able to make a rapid diagnosis. A any other comments or questions? How do other doctors learn about asbestos causing all of these diseases? Is it taught at like uh, your AMA conferences or anything like that? Because I know that my husband's doctor, who uh, from Ambler, Pennsylvania, where everybody in Ambler had some kind of asbestos ex exposure, diagnosed my husband as having a, a cloud on his lung and maybe you need a CT scan. So I want to know how do we educate doctors that aren't specialists? Well, I, 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 unfortunately it's not done well. And I think the overlooking failure to diagnose malignant mesothelioma, overlooking asbestos-related lung cancer, uh, overlooking ovarian cancer that might be related to talc exposure illustrates that education of physicians is woefully lacking, at least in my opinion and in my experience. It's not taught adequately in medical schools. Even, even today, it was not taught, uh, well, it was virtually taught not at all when I was in medical school, which goes to show how old I am. Uh, it's a little bit better now, but not much better and not a lot of attention to it is given in medical residency training programs, in, even in pulmonary fellowships where asbestos-related lung disease is perhaps best recognized among the uh, asbestos-related diseases. So, so that's been my experience. I'd be interested to know the experience of those of you on the panel. Jackie? Uh, I think that it's, it's um, among the pulmonary specialists, they'll, they'll note that, yes, they had asbestos exposure, and occasionally you'll see a two- or three-line history in the medical records. Um, but, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, how can we get the word out of people to even take a history? And, and I'm thinking we better start making some videos and start posting them, because that's how the younger generation is getting all their information, is not through reading, and we don't have these organizational grand rounds or weekly lectures in the same way that are seem to be as effective. And I think um, we need to get the word out better. The reality is for folks, and, and I want to reiterate what Steve Markowitz said in the earlier session, which is, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to review cases of mesothelioma from around the country. And the care, I, I, I cringe when I get records from a certain area 
in the country because I know that the doctors there will not attribute anyone coming in with the most classic signs that would be found in Italy immediately as having mesothelioma. It will be attributed and there will be months long diagnostic, futile diagnostic testing until they finally arrive at a diagnosis when it may be too late for other treatments. So you need to get to a center that specializes in the appropriate care as soon as possible. Yes. Hi, my name's Dorothy Wigmore. I'm from the Canadian side of the border. Um, and um, one, tying into your, to your last point there, um, I have a, had a friend in Winnipeg uh, who was diagnosed with what she was told was lung cancer. Of course, it turned out to be mesothelioma. And um, one of the things that I tried to help to, her to do was to find out about treatment. Um, and I've been impressed with hearing um, from people who have uh, been living with mesothelioma for much longer than my friend Susan did. Um, and she chose not to have treatment, but I, I, I don't know how much of that was because she wasn't, what kind of information she was getting. I wasn't in town, I wasn't able to have conversations with her. So I'm just sort of curious about what the, you know, the best treatment is um, that's out there that people ought to be knowing to know about. And thinking back to to uh, what was said at the beginning about um, going from one hospital to another and ending up in Regina, where um, she should have ended up in the first place, kind of thing. So, where do people look for the best treatment, and what is it these days? Perhaps we could take that question during the break. I think okay. we are out of time. Okay. I'm very sorry, but yep. we'll be around and would be happy to, okay. uh, to, to talk to you about that. 